O oh God, come to my assistance. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. You are the temple of the living God, just as God had said. I will dwell with them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us purify ourselves from every defilement of flesh and spirit, and in the fear of God strive to fulfill our consecration perfectly. Let the saints rejoice in the Lord. Let the saints rejoice in the Lord. God has chosen you as his own. Rejoice in the Lord. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Let the saints rejoice in the Lord. How glorious is that kingdom where all the saints rejoice with Christ. Clothed in white robes, they follow the Lamb wherever he goes. My soul.
God is the reward of all the saints. Let us joyfully call upon him, Lord, save your people. Lord, save your people. O God, through your Son, Jesus Christ, you built your church on the foundation of the apostles. Keep their teachings secure among your faithful people. Lord, save your people. You made the martyrs powerful witnesses, even to the point of giving up their lives. Help all Christians to give faithful witness to your Son. Lord, save your people. You gave holy virgins a, the gift of imitating the virginity of Christ. May those consecrated to virginity be steadfast witnesses to the coming of your kingdom. Lord, save your people. Your saints uh, now see you face to face. Keep alive in our hearts the hope of coming at last into your presence. Lord, save your people. Bring all who have died into the company of heaven with Mary, Joseph, and all your saints, and give us also a place in the unending fellowship of your kingdom. Lord, save your people. Let us now pray with confidence in the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, amen. Let us pray. Almighty ever-living God, by whose gift we venerate in one celebration the merits of all the saints, bestow on us, we pray, through the prayers of so many intercessors, an abundance of the reconciliation with you for which we earnestly long. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Our help is in the name of the Lord. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Salve Regina.
Today we begin again the reflection upon the Psalms. And uh, th this evening, the Psalm is going to be Psalm number six. This is a very beautiful Psalm dealing with anxiety, with fear, with the struggles we face in life. And it is a very special because it is the first of what is known as the penitential Psalms. Those Psalms are Psalm number six, number 32, number 38, 51, 102, 130, and 143. I feel like I'm at a football game calling out numbers. But those are the Psalms, the seven penitential Psalms. And they are what is known in the study of uh, the Psalms as they're known as laments. Uh, they are Psalms which speak of the sorrow and the struggle of life. Sometimes in the book of Psalms, you would have lament for the nation as when it was facing famine or plague or war. And uh, sometimes, very often in the Psalms, you would find a lament for the struggles of life, the way people are facing different difficulties of life. And uh, that they're very, they touch our hearts, these Psalms, because we all face different struggles in this Valley of Tears. And the remarkable thing as we pray Psalm number six is we know that the Psalmist is going through some terrible sickness or something. It, it's very intense, very concrete. We can feel we are with the Psalmist. And yet we don't exactly know what the sickness is. It's kind of open-ended. And so in many ways, these Psalms are like cups into which we pour our life. They're shaped in order to be able to work upon the struggle of life, but we ourselves pour our own individual struggles into them. That's one of the great blessings if we take upon ourselves the custom of uh, praying the divine office, because as we pray the Psalms day by day, or just read, here's a book of Psalms, just read a Psalm a day. But if we pray the divine office, we can begin to go from day to day, from hour to hour, and each time we pray a psalm, we can not only pour into it our own immediate experience and have that transformed by the natural and the divine beauty of the language, but also if we perhaps are not feeling, for example, as distraught as the person is feeling in Psalm number six, well, we pray the psalm for somebody else. And that's the most loving and beautiful thing. It's the secret of praying the Psalms, especially the divine office, when we sort of eat what's on your plate. We take one Psalm after another, all set up according to a pattern, spread out over basically four weeks. And it's inevitable in such a situation that although from time to time, we'll come upon a Psalm that expresses perfectly where we are, either in our joy of the moment, or perhaps in our great sorrow as in the one today. But most often, probably, if we pray the Psalms in that kind of a manner, we will not be actually synch synchronizing our own life to that of the Psalm. But that's even better, because then we can be stretched out of our own ego. Suppose I'm happy as a lark, and I read this, Lord, reprove me not in your anger, punish me not in your rage. Well, maybe I need to think of somebody who doesn't have the experience I have right now. Or suppose I'm feeling like the psalmist in today's psalm, I'm feeling distraught, I'm overwhelmed, I don't know how I can go on. And then I pray a psalm in the divine office that's something like, come bring out our joy to the Lord, hail the rock who saves us. Well, I should remember there are other people who have situations different from mine, and in both times I can pray for them. Now, as usual, I'm, I'm bringing a little show and tell. Um, this, is, uh, this is a wonderful book, this is the the Grail Psalms, the ones we use in the Divine Office. There is a newer version, I think I have it here. Here's the newer version. It's a little more accurate, but uh, some of the things are a little more accurate. But I just, I just love, this is the one that's in the printed bravery, and I, I just love it. It has some wonderful little introductions to all the Psalms as well. This is a great little book of Psalms. It's the same Psalms, but it's a nice uh, pocket form you can carry it with you anytime you want. So this is just, just wonderful. This is just the Hebrew Psalms. Uh, here is the divine office. It's four volumes like this. And this, uh, can t this is the one we have for ordinary time. We're coming near up to the end, uh, we'll soon be at Advent. 
And uh, we, we start anew with Advent. And I'd say if you're praying the office, at the beginning of the Advent volume, you'll find a wonderful general instruction on the Liturgy of the Hours. It's well worth reading, not only because it tells us technical details of how to pray this, but because it has a profound spirituality that instructs us on the praying of this great prayer. But what we find in here for every day is Office of Readings, which is like what the monks do in the middle of the night, three Psalms, a lengthy scripture reading and a reading from the spiritual traditional fathers of the church or something. Then there's morning prayer, midday prayer, short morning prayer is three Psalms, a hymn, a canticle, the Benedictus, and then some other prayers and things like that. Midday prayer is some very short Psalms. Evening prayer, like what we pray just now in the divine office here in the cathedral. And then a little short prayer, night prayer, just before we go to bed. And that's the whole divine office. But you can also get this, much smaller, carry it with you. And what this has is morning prayer, evening prayer, and night prayer. So it's great. It's if you want a smaller form of the office. What we don't have here is midday prayer, though you can get a little one like this. And what we don't have here as well is uh, the office of readings, the longer readings from scripture. So anyway, those are some things I highly recommend. So let's just reflect upon Psalm number six. The penitential Psalms, which it uh, begins, um, are found within the sacred scriptures uh, and they are used in the spiritual tradition of the church. They are used in order to help people uh, basically repent of their sins. Uh, they're not a, a thing that the, the Hebrew people thought of when they were, when the Psalms were being written. Instead, they are, the penitential Psalms were created really in the Christian tradition. And they are prayed again in the divine office throughout the different weeks. And they're very, very beautiful. They speak of, not only in this Psalm here, it speaks to us of, uh, sor of sorrow because of affliction in, uh, in sickness. But uh, the penitential Psalms uh, speak to us of the affliction of the heart, which is sin. Every Friday uh, in the divine office, Psalm 51, the greatest of the penitential Psalms, miserere, the miserere, have mercy on me, O God, in your kindness your compassion blot out my offense. This great Psalm is prayed every Friday in the morning. We also have Psalm 32, which is a very great Psalm that speaks to us of repentance for sin and the need to break through our own tendency to not remember our own need for God's mercy. And then Psalm 38, which again is much like Psalm 6. The Psalm 102, Psalm 130 is famous, out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. And uh, Psalm 143 is again, like Psalm 6, a psalm of sorrow in the midst of our struggles. It's a custom to pray these during Lent. St. Augustine, as he was dying, had the penitential psalms chanted and written on sheets on the wall of where he was dying. It is a custom which I have followed over the years to when at uh, the different times I <laughs> ordained as a deacon, a priest and a bishop to pray the seven penitential psalms and I'll be asking the three seminarians who are going to be ordained as deacons this Saturday to pray the seven penitential Psalms before they undertake that sacred office. So that's a little introductory material and let's now enter into our time of prayer with Psalm number six, which is a Psalm of struggle, facing the reality of mortality, of sickness and of death which help us then to understand more fully what this life is all about. So let us begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty God, we ask you to guide us and bless us, send your Holy Spirit upon us. Take away from us all distractions that are barriers so that there may be a pathway to our hearts that you may enter in away with all those distractions. Free us, O oh Lord, from our sins, that we may with pure heart hear 
your holy word as you speak to us in this psalm. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. Lord, do not reprove me in your anger. Punish me not in your rage. Have mercy on me, Lord. I have no strength. Lord, heal me. My body is racked. My soul is racked with pain. But you, O oh Lord, how long? Return, O oh Lord, rescue my soul. Save me in your merciful love. For in death, no one remembers you. From the grave, who can give you praise? I'm exhausted with my groaning. Every night I drench my pillow with tears. I bedew my bed with weeping. My eye wastes away with grief. I have grown old, surrounded by my foes. Leave me, all you who do evil. For the Lord has heard my weeping. The Lord has heard my pleas. The Lord will accept my prayer. All my foes will retire in confusion, foiled and suddenly confounded. What does this psalm say to our head, to our heart, to our hands? We always think of that when we read the sacred scriptures and pray the scriptures. What does it say to my head as it speaks to me? so that I may have greater insight into to life, to God, to who God is and who each one of us is. What does it say to my heart as it speaks to the way in which I relate to the person of the living God? It's not just from the neck up, it's deep passion, emotion. For we are not robots, we are people, and certainly in this psalm we see with deep emotions, especially when faced with sickness and with the prospect of death. And what does it say to my hands to reach out, to help, to be with those who struggle? We think of the, the people who came to comfort Job. Maybe they shouldn't have been talking so much and trying to explain sickness and suffering to him but they at least came, they, they walked to him, they were with him. And how do we, in our own experience, if we should ever have such an experience of suffering, how are we going to actually deal with it? And how can we, as Christians, interpret this in our own life? And when we know of people who are going through this, and I think each of us in different ways knows of people who in some way are going through this. I think even of the people in this city who are homeless, especially as the winter approaches, they pray this psalm without any need for imagination. Or we think of the people in this time of pandemic who are cut off from their families. We think of the people who are struggling, gasping for air, we think of all those who are suffering, for whom these words are powerful. How do we reach out to them? We don't just hear these words and move on the way that the priest and the Levite walked on when they saw the person at the side of the road. Here is the person at the side of the road, here. And these words speak to our hearts, our head and our hands, asking us to do something to move out and not just observe with cold and icy detachment the realities of suffering in this world. That's why praying the Psalms, and this is one of the most powerful, is so important in our life. It's why the custom of the divine office is so valuable. Lord, do not reprove me in your anger. Punish me not in your rage. This person is suffering somehow. We don't know what it is. And we can fill in our own 
suggestions, whatever it might be. Maybe a sickness, a sickness of the body, or perhaps a sickness of the soul, perhaps an addiction, or perhaps not a disease. We could see similar experiences when people have lost their jobs or when a family member has been tragically taken from them or for other disasters and cares. Lord, do not reprove me in your anger. Punish me not in your rage. Sometimes our first thought is, why is God doing this to me? And of course, our Lord says in the gospel, this was written long before the gospel, the tower that fell on the 18 people, it wasn't because of their sins that it fell, it fell because it fell. And that's all. So we don't think that God is punishing us by, because of our sins, we get sick or something like that. We know that's not true, but the first reaction can often be that. Lord, do not reprove me in your anger, punish me not in your rage. We realize when we're going through this kind of anguish, that something is out of joint in the world. And we say, Lord, help me. In this short Psalm, the great and holy name of God, which begins the Psalm, it's sacred to the Jewish people, they don't even pronounce it. The sacred four letters of the name of God, which in most of our translations, we should simply say, Lord. In the Hebrew, they say, Adonai, my Lord. Or sometimes in my little Greek, uh, my Hebrew text here, it simply, in the notes it says, Hashem, the name. And it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight times, eight times in this short Psalm. In the midst of our affliction, we call out to the name of the Lord. We should think of this as well. As we celebrate early in the year, the holy name of Jesus, reflect on that. Lord, do not reprove me in your anger. Punish me not in your rage. Have mercy on me, Lord. I have no strength. Help. It's like Peter. He's going down, reaching out. Have mercy on me, Lord. I have no strength. We don't think that way when all is well and we're just humming along and perfect health and everything's great. We are under the illusion, like the captain of the Titanic, full speed ahead. And yet that is so foolish. Lord, have mercy on me, O Lord. Like the great Psalm 51, which deals with the struggle, not with sickness directly, but with sin. Have mercy on me, Lord. I have no strength. I can't handle this. I'm not in control. The illusion of control is a deadly thing. None of us is in control. And sometimes we think we are. And if we're not in control anymore, and sometimes that is one of the arguments for euthanasia, that when I can sing and dance and run and things like that, that my life was worthwhile. But when I can't do all of that, I have no strength anymore. What's the point? But we're so much more than our physical ability to sing and dance and run and be dynamic. And those in our community who have no strength are every bit as important as you or me or anyone. We need to recognize I have no strength. I fool myself into thinking that I'm in control of life or maybe even worse, in control of other people. And that's just not right. Let's ask the Lord's forgiveness for the times we've gotten cocky and like fools think we're in control. Lord, heal me. My body is racked, my soul is racked with pain. 
Lord, heal me. We think of all the miracles of healing that are found in the New Testament, physical healing, but everyone who was healed died, including Lazarus who was healed of death and then he died eventually. And so we pray for that. But if we are healed of our physical affliction, we're just gonna die a bit later. Life is short, eternity is long. We don't, the runway is short. We don't know, no matter how long it may seem, none of us is gonna be around that long. I tell you, as you get older, you realize it more and more. Lord, teach me the shortness of life that I may gain wisdom of heart. Lord, heal me, my body is racked. My soul is racked with pain. And this takes us beyond the physical sickness. It may be that this applies to some disease and we can all substitute whatever it is in our own case. But my soul is racked with pain. Sometimes it's not a physical sickness that sends us into this sense of I have no strength. It may be a psychological sickness. It may be a moral struggle. It may be especially an addiction, disordered tendency of any kind. My soul is racked with pain. And that's why in every Catholic church, we have the Stations of the Cross. We have the Tabernacle, our Lord present in glory. We have the altar where the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass is offered. But we have the Stations of the Cross. Take up your cross and come follow me, says the Lord. My, heal me, my body is racked, my soul is racked with pain. And those wise words in the Hail Holy Queen, this valley of tears. This isn't the kind of stuff we get on social media and on TV and stuff. And it's reality though. Our sign is not a happy face on a stick. It's the cross of Jesus Christ. But you, O oh Lord, how long? Oh my, do we ever get that way? We say, Lord, how long? whether it is physical sickness perhaps, or struggle, or even when you see some of the things that are happening in this world, you say, Lord, how long? Oh my gosh. We think it's, it's just like when there was a great, uh, the schism of the church in the Middle Ages. Some people were thinking of our Lord in the boat, you know, in the storm, boom, up and down. I say, Lord, how long are you gonna be asleep in the boat? Help us, help. And sometimes you can kind of feel that way. Lord, how long? And <coughs> Psalm number 13, which like a lot of these Psalms, this Psalm here is prayed in the beginning of the day in week one of the divine office uh, on uh, Monday of week one. But in the middle of the day, we get some of the most beautiful Psalms that are prayed in the office. And here is one that uh, <coughs> we can, uh, I think we can all identify with sometimes the middle of a day and it's, it's Tuesday, midday prayer, week one. Psalm 13, it's an expansion of this line. How long, O Lord, will you forget me? How long will you hide your face? How long must I bear grief in my soul this sorrow in my heart day and night. How long shall my enemy prevail? Look at me, answer me, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes, lest I fall asleep in death. Lest my enemies say I have overcome him. Lest my foes rejoice to see me fall. As for me, I trust in your merciful love. Let my heart rejoice in your saving help. Let me sing to the Lord for his goodness to me, singing psalms in the name, to the name of the Lord, the Most High. And that's sort of like Psalm 6, but it really takes that one line. 
How long, O oh Lord? Oh my gosh, how long, how long, O oh Lord? Help. And how many times have any of us think, you know, that we would say to God in our prayers, we're usually very polite, look at me, answer me, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes, lest I fall asleep in death, lest my enemies say I have overcome him, lest my foes rejoice to see my fall. The psalmist is very close to God, and sometimes when you're so close to someone, you can talk bluntly. And that's what the psalmist does, especially in Psalm 13, which, but also here in this line from Psalm 6. My soul is racked with pain, but you, O oh Lord, how long? Maybe we need to be like that too. Perhaps in our quiet prayer, not only when praying the Psalms, just let it out. But like our Lord in the Garden of Gethsemane. Just Father, Father. That's just no need to be on our best behavior. He is our Lord and our God. And I think, you know, many people come to every Catholic church throughout the day to spend their time and pour out their hearts before our Eucharistic Lord and the Blessed Sacrament. This is a treasure beyond price. Lord, I'm sinking, help. There's no better prayer than that. That's Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God. Have mercy on me, a sinner. But you, O Lord, how long? Return, O Lord, rescue my soul. Save me in your merciful love. Help. Remember the name of Jesus. It means savior, the one who saves us. Like a fireman running into a burning building to rescue someone, like a, a lifeguard diving in to rescue someone who's drowning. We, we say savior so often, it becomes a blur. Jesus is the one who rescues us, pulls us out when we're drowning. You, O oh Lord, how long return, O oh Lord, rescue my soul. Save me in your merciful love. For in death, no one remembers you from the grave who can give you praise. This was more difficult for the psalmist than for us because an, an understanding that there is life beyond the grave came very late in Revelation, even in the time of our Lord. You know, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Sadducees said there's no resurrection. They always joke, that's why they were sad, you see, because they didn't believe in that resurrection. And so the people of this, the, who wrote the, the inspired writer had not yet received this hope that we have as Christians. And can you imagine then how that intensifies the call to the Lord God for help? For in death, no one remembers you from the grave who can give you praise. And this is something now, oh my, have we ever felt this way or do we know someone? Maybe we know someone right now who is in this situation. I'm exhausted with my groaning. Every night I drench my pillow with tears. I bedew my bed with weeping. My eye wastes away with grief. I have grown old, surrounded by my foes. I think we can sometimes take a problem if it's, we know it's gonna be over quickly. But what if it goes on and on? I have grown old, surrounded by my foes. This is maybe where we could read the book of Job, which deals and wrestles with the great issue, the problem of evil. I'm exhausted with my groaning. Every night I drench my pillow with tears. I bedew my bed with weeping. Just imagine that, someone crying through the night. You know how in the nighttime, if we are in fact in such a situation of anguish, the clock can slow down to almost stopping. In the silence of the night, there's no running away. 
This is true with all of our different concerns. You know, we find distraction and busyness, but in the dark and the cold and the silence of the night, we come face to face with reality. And that's why uh, a life of contemplation is not a, an easy escape from life. It's where you come face to face. In the early fathers of the church, the desert fathers, they spoke of the demons you meet in the middle of the night. And sometimes demons, literally demons, and sometimes we speak of the demons within us that we can, when we get off the merry-go-round, spinning around and around, and we begin to stop and look at what's really there as we have to, there's no solution in just dodging this stuff. Then weeping, drenching my pillow with tears, my eye wastes away with grief. I've grown old, surrounded by my foes. And so in all of this psalm, we have expressed so powerfully what happens within the human heart when we face the reality of suffering, the reality of evil that touches us deeply. Or if we pray this psalm for someone we love or someone we don't even know, whoever it may be, just as uh, on November the 11th, we lay a wreath at the tomb of the unknown soldier. Can we pray this song for the unknown sufferer, whoever it may be, somewhere, somewhere, there's someone who's just right here. Maybe I'm not right here now, but that doesn't matter. I don't pray it for myself. I pray it for others, just as Jesus did on the cross when he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Even God, came here, did not, the second person of the Trinity did not cling to his equality with God, but emptied himself even to death, death on the cross, so that he knows what it's like. He did not hide in majesty, but in the blood of the cross he came to be with us. That is sublime. And we're called to do that too, as Jesus, through the words of the Psalm, expressed what he was doing on the cross, which also like this Psalm and like Psalm 13, ends with victory. Just always read some, we always know the opening lines, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Read the whole Psalm. The last lines are victory, the victory of Easter, the rescue from God, the rescue as he comes to us. I'm exhausted with my groaning, Every night I drench my pillow with tears. I bedew my bed with weeping. My eye wastes away with grief. I have grown old, surrounded by my foes. Then there is a break. Just as in Psalm 13, after that expressing that, answer me, answer me, Lord, then there's a change. And the change comes from the recognition that in the midst of our suffering, God is with us every step of the way. Just as in that uh, poem about, you know, we were walking along side by side through the sand and just when things got worse, I saw I, there was only one set of footprints. Ah, says the Lord, that's when I was carrying you. And so at this point, I have grown old, surrounded by my foes. There seems to be no hope. Then leave me all you who do evil, for the Lord has heard my weeping. The Lord has heard my plea. The Lord will accept my prayer. The Lord, the Lord, the Lord. He comes in glory. The Lord will accept my prayer. All my foes will retire in confusion, foiled and suddenly confounded. I've grown old, surrounded by my foes. All my foes will retire in confusion, foiled and suddenly confounded. And that is the way in which our life goes forward. We, from cross to crown, from Calvary to the resurrection, and whether our tomorrows be filled with good or ill, 
will triumph through our sorrows and rise to bless you still. That's from my favorite hymn, O God Beyond All Praising. We'll triumph through our sorrows and rise to bless you still. And that is the deep resilience of the life of holiness we celebrate on the Feast of All Saints. Because we don't know our life is not going to be, whether our tomorrows be filled with good or ill. We think of the different saints. We think of Father McGivney, but beatified, and the ones that we know, of course, all saints is for all of us, but who died at a very early age. He didn't have a long life. And he had a lot of suffering. Think of Carlo Acutis, the wonderful young man. Such depth. Oh my gosh. He, he died at the age of 15. And he showed his wisdom just a few months before by saying, I'm destined to die. It's are we all. We just don't know it. He did. And so he went through that. We can imagine, I drench my pillow with tears. I bedew my bed with weeping and then to the glory of the Lord. And notice in every Psalm where the word, where the name of God is found. Eight times in this very short Psalm, we find the Lord, the Lord, rich in kindness, abounding in goodness, always there to help us. In the midst of the storm, usually, this, this is very blunt. This is not a wishy-washy, everything's just great, don't worry, it's okay. That's a phony approach to religion. It's just not real, it's not realistic. And one thing religion is, is real. The real religion is real. We enter through that and that we see that in the suffering, death and resurrection of Christ. So with that spirit, let's think of the people that we know, each one of us, for whom this psalm requires no imagination. Think of ones who are suffering, either people we personally know, or maybe ourselves, who knows? Any one of us here may have some great fear of disease or death, or we may be struggling with something. Or if we don't know of anyone, or if we're not ourselves there at that moment in this place, let's make that greatest act of love and pray this psalm of sadness and anguish, ultimately trust and joy. Let's pray it for someone unknown to us who's going through what this psalm expresses so powerfully. Lord, do not reprove me in your anger. Punish me not in your rage. Have mercy on me, Lord, I have no strength. Lord, heal me. My body is racked. My soul is racked with pain. But you, O oh Lord, how long? Return, Lord, rescue my soul. Save me in your merciful love. For in death, no one remembers you. From the grave, who can give you praise? I'm exhausted with my groaning. Every night I drench my pillow with tears. I bedew my bed with weeping. My eyes waste away with grief. I have grown old, surrounded by my foes. Leave me, all you who do evil, for the Lord has heard my weeping. The Lord has heard my plea. The Lord will accept my prayer. All my foes will retire in confusion, foiled and suddenly confounded. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. 
Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end, amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.